Daniel Webster is a, a hard act to follow, but uh, here we are. Um, thank you, Representative Cartwright, for your remarks today. And more importantly, uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, the numbers you just quoted uh, speak for themselves. And those numbers are not just dollars. Those numbers are people who are represented rather than being unrepresented. Those are people who uh, remain in their homes. Those are people who remain safe from violence in their homes. Those are people who uh, get their veterans benefits. And so we're very grateful for your leadership. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I am surrounded by uh, leaders today, judicial leaders who are really on the front lines of uh, thinking about how to make access to justice a reality in their states and in our country. Uh, this, this is uh, a watershed moment for LSC, and I, I would say for access to justice. Uh, in one sense, it's a watershed moment because this is the first time in four years we've been able to meet like this, and the energy that we feel at this moment is real and palpable and different from uh, even all of our effective uh, uh, Zoom uh, programs over the course of the last several years. But this is also a watershed moment because the confluence of COVID and the eviction crisis and the reaction of the legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branches to the eviction crisis, which is ongoing, has been a model for all of us. And I think the COVID, the pandemic has accentuated the need for legal aid and has accentuated the justice gap. We've heard reference to it today several times. Over 90% of the problems faced by low-income Americans, the important, significant uh, civil legal problems are met with uh, essentially no assistance. And half, half, of the eligible applicants who make it to the door of civil legal aid in America are turned away for lack of resources. So that's a problem. And it's a problem that um, in the first instance, we in the legal profession uh, think about. And it's a problem that our justice leaders around the country, and we are fortunate to have four of them today joining us, are thinking about uh, solving, and one way to solve it is to increase the number of people, the categories of people who can help and provide legal assistance to those in need and to identify programs in which uh, paraprofessionals and other non-lawyers can help in specified categories of cases, be they housing eviction or, or family cases. Uh, again, we're uh, blessed to have uh, four um, real leaders in this uh, um, process of thinking about how to expand uh, representation, and I will introduce them from the far end of the table all the way to uh, my neighbor here. Um, at the far end, uh, Lori Gilday is the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. She was appointed to the court in 2006 and has served as uh, Chief Justice since 2010. Uh, next is uh, Nathan Hecht, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas. He has served on the court since 1988 and is the longest serving member of the court in Texas history and the longest tenured Texas judge in active service. Uh, next, we have uh, uh, Megan Flynn is the Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court. Uh, she assumed that role on January 1st and has served on the Oregon Supreme Court since uh, 2017. And then next to me is Loretta Rush, the Chief Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court. Uh, she joined the court in 2012 and was named Chief Justice in 2014. Uh, Chief Justice Rush is also the president of the Conference of Chief Justices. And uh, really, that organization is a major and very credible ally of LSC uh, in educating Congress about the importance of civil legal aid. So uh, to start off the conversation, uh, Chief Justice Heck, let's start with you and kind of set the stage. You've said, quote, 
There's just no way in a country like the United States that we can sit by and let so many people in need of access to justice not get it. Can you t uh, share your thoughts on what undergirds this belief and what role the judiciary should play in increasing access to justice for low-income Americans? We all often think of or hear that judges are you know, just calling balls and strikes and uh, not much beyond that. Well, thanks, Ron, for the invitation to be here, and thanks uh, to John Levy for uh, convening us once again uh, to talk about this crucial subject. We're here, uh, the four of us, uh, because we see every day in the stewardship of the uh, legal systems in our state, the justice, not the justice gap, the justice chasm is what it amounts to, stories like John Grisham tells so powerfully that are playing out in real lives uh, every day in the courts of our states. And so um, we feel like that it is important not only to the people who are involved, very important to them, of course, their lives are involved, but also important to the integrity of the rule of law because we can't pre preside over justice systems where only the rich can get to it, uh, a justice system that serves uh, only the people who can afford it is not justice for all, certainly, certainly not, not justice at all. Um, so that's why it is so important to us that the justice system not just hold uh, the promise of justice to the ear um, but, uh, den and deny it to the heart, but that it is real to people who uh, come seeking what they uh, have been promised and are, are trying to find it in the courthouse. So how do we do that? Um, we uh, have worked very hard to try to uh, engender uh, support uh, from uh, public policy makers like the members of Congress that you just heard from uh, by legislative uh, officers in our states. Uh, to try to make sure that they are aware of the uh, scope of the problem uh, and how they can uh, make meaningful contributions um, toward uh, fixing it. We have also um, tried to enlist support from outside the legal community. Uh, the congressman had everybody raise your hand if you're a lawyer. I didn't look around to see who, uh, uh, how many there was. Probably he should ask, raise your hand if you're not a lawyer, and uh, we would have gotten a better feeling uh, for who's in the room, but um, we're going to hear in a little while from uh, people in the business community who share our concern uh, for uh, uh, better access to justice. We can expand delivery, and so that's what we're mostly here about today, um, to find ways of making it possible for legal services to be provided even when uh, there's not always an availability of lawyers. Now, truth to tell, we could have done this uh, 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, but we're doing it now. And COVID has provoked us, uh, and we're looking, taking a hard look at all of these systems and operations, and this is an opportunity for us to see that if trained people uh, can bring um, basic civil legal help uh, to people in ways that uh, close or narrow the gap um, that we're concerned about, then this will be all to the better. None of us is for dumbed down justice. None of us is for secondhand, uh, second tier, uh, shorthand ways of getting through the system. We all wanna make sure that the system serves everyone who needs it uh, well. But these are, we're all working on ways where we can do that uh, with people who do not always have um, uh, law licenses who can still provide those services. And there's one other thing at stake besides um, the integrity of the rule of law, and that is public trust and confidence in the courts. Because when they're, if they're not there, uh, when the people need them, then people lose confidence in the courts. It, no secret um, that public trust and confidence in the courts is waning. Um, we're way ahead of Congress, no offense, uh, but, uh, we, but we, uh, we see that, it, it's, that it's slipping uh, and it needs to be fortified. We can't talk about decisions. Uh, we can't talk about the, way we de the decisions we make in particular cases, but we can make the system run better so that when you need it, it's there. So that's um, why we think, uh, and 
Truth to tell, uh, Ron, uh, there's 58 of us in the Confer National Conference of Chief Justices. You could put the names in a hat and draw four out, and they'd come up here and tell you the same thing that we're going to tell you, uh, because it, it's not a it's not peculiar to our states or to us individually. It's something that the uh, state justice system share. I appreciate it, but I, I still feel we've been lucky. We've, the luck of the draw has been favorable to us today, so we're glad to have all of you. Uh, Chief Justice Flynn, uh, responsive to the justice gap and mindful of the uh, consumer protection concerns, if you will, about uh, uh, the quality of service provided, uh, I believe um, six states, including Oregon, have uh, expanded uh, the categories of uh, people who can um, provide some sort of legal assistance, uh, paraprofessionals, trained paraprofessionals. Uh, I should add that eight other states are in the midst of considering similar changes. Can you tell us about what uh, you're seeing in Oregon? What are the goals and uh, design principles of your licensed paralegal professional program? Sure, thank you, Ron. Thanks to all the board members who are here for giving us this opportunity to talk about what we're doing. So Oregon is on the verge of launching a paralegal licensing program. Our program is designed to balance the two core values of access to justice and consumer protection. We are convinced that um, allowing limited representation by well-trained paralegals will make legal proceedings more accessible to those low and moderate income Oregonians who currently their only other option is no representation. And we're convinced that we can do this without creating additional risk of harm to those people who are already vulnerable. Because access to justice is our focus, paralegals in Oregon will be licensed at least initially to practice only in the areas of family law and landlord tenant. Those are the areas that we know uh, have the most acute need for legal providers. And it's probably not unique to our state, but you know, we know our numbers in domestic relations. 86% of our cases have at least one party who's self-represented. And in landlord tenant in the area of eviction, 97% of our cases have at least one party who's self-represented. In Oregon, the issue of paralegal licensing has largely been driven by our bar association, um, which has spent a lot of time working through and implementing the best way to do this, starting with a work group in 2017 that explored a lot of what was being done in other states, including Arizona, and ultimately recommended that Oregon come up with and develop a plan that led to an implementation committee that met for approximately two years, and in, um, April of 2022, that implementation committee delivered its final report and recommended draft rules for both um, uh, admissions process and limitations on licensing, as well as rules of professional conduct for the paralegals. The, my Supreme Court approved a number of steps along the way, but in 2022, July 2022, we approved the final report as well as the rules. Those go live um, July 1, 2023, so coming right up. So what can paralegals do in Oregon if they're licensed? Um, they will have to be specifically licensed in either the area of family law or landlord tenant or both. Uh, and within those areas, the practice rules identify specific categories of cases and specific actions that paralegals can and can't take. Probably the, the main dividing line is that licensed paralegals in our state will not be able to appear on behalf of a client in court. But they can assist clients with a wide variety of other tasks like completing forms, drafting documents, filing documents, and in court advising their clients as the clients represent themselves. Ensuring competency for all of our licensees was a top priority for the bar and the court. So we have a minimum educational requirement, which is applicants must have one of three educational degrees, either an associate's degree in paralegal studies, a bachelor's degree in any field, or a JD or LLB. But there's also a waiver process for what we call highly experienced paralegals, meaning generally somebody who has five years of full-time substantial par paralegal experience. In addition, there's essentially a CLE, 20 hours of a CLE type requirement before they are licensed. Uh, the applicants also must meet an experience requirement 
they, we settled on 1,500 hours of substantive experience working as a paralegal under a supervising attorney within the three years prior to licensing. And there's an additional requirement that some of those hours be in the field either of family law or landlord tenant, depending on which area the person is seeking a license in. In addition, our applicants have to demonstrate competence in three different ways. One is a portfolio of work. One is a demonstration of the knowledge of rules of professional responsibility through either passing a course that the bar creates or taking a test. And then um, there was some concern that there at least ought to be a knowledge tested to ensure that they understand the scope of the limitations of what their practice is. And so there is an exam component just as to the scope of practice. Uh, we have a few additional safeguards for consumer protection. Just like lawyers in Oregon, our paralegals will have to maintain malpractice insurance, maintain lawyer trust accounts, and contribute to our client security fund. They also have to comply with the rules of professional conduct. Well, thank you. What, one uh, takeaway that I think is really important and uh, heartening is that this effort was uh, co-led by the bar because we often hear and uh, see that the bar can be a force for uh, support and leadership or uh, um, opposition. And it's great to see uh, states in which uh, they're leaders for support. Uh, Chief Justice Gilday, uh, Minnesota is farther down the road in terms of your paraprofessional program. Um, can you tell us what uh, what you're seeing in Minnesota, what have you learned so far, what has success looked like, and in light of success, what have you, you done further? Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us uh, here today. So in Minnesota, we're operating a three-year pilot um, as a way of seeing if we can meet some of the unmet legal, legal needs through the work of paraprofessionals. Um, we're uh, choosing to pilot what we already have in Minnesota, so we're not uh, taking an, an approach where we have to build something new. So we set up this pilot. We started it in, in uh, 2021, and under the pilot, paraprofessionals can represent clients and appear in court in three case types. A landlord-tenant, um, on behalf of the tenant, in... Um, undisputed or less complex family law matters, and in orders for protection and harassment restraining order cases. Um, Minnesota, well, the, we, we chose these three areas, not surprisingly, because as Chief Justice Flynn mentioned, these are the case types that are uh, typically where clients appear without uh, representation. Minnesota is unique among states that allow paraprofessionals to provide legal help to litigants and that we require that the paraprofessional work under the supervision of a licensed attorney. This doesn't mean that the lawyer is you know, joined at the hip with the paraprofessional, but the attorney does need to be involved at the beginning in helping select cases, making sure the case is appropriate for paraprofessional assistance, and then, of course, be available for any questions that might arise. And, the lawyer can be disciplined if things go awry with the work of the paraprofessional. We set up the program by court rule. Um, the rule is modeled after our student practice rule. You can go to the judiciary's website and, and just put paraprofessional pilot in the search bar and that'll take you to the landing page and you can get all the details about the program. But essentially we implemented the pilot uh, through a, a standing committee uh, the standing committee has representation from the academic world. There are a couple of judges, a couple of attorneys, and a couple of paralegals on the standing committee. And so if you're a paraprofessional and you want to participate in the pilot, you apply to the standing committee. They assess um, your qualifications and see if you satisfy the requirements of the rule and then put you on the roster and you can start doing the work. Um, the standing committee is also monitoring the program and uh, issuing interim reports to the Supreme Court um, you know, letting us know how it's going and making recommendations for tweaking of the rule as the pilot is um, underway. We got a report from the standing committee last year and they recommended that we expand the cases uh, where paraprofessionals can be involved. Initially, when we started the pilot, um, we said if the case, it's a family law case, but it has allegations of domestic violence, we can't have paraprofessionals involved. And initially, we didn't let paraprofessionals participate in orders for protection and harassment restraining order cases. 
The Standing Committee recommended that the court enlarge the pilot to allow paraprofessionals to participate in those case types. And after a public hearing, um, we agreed and we expanded the pilot to include those case types, but we required that the Standing Committee develop some additional training, um, working with advocates for victims of domestic violence and the Bar Association put together training unique for those case types. So now paraprofessionals can participate in those case types as well, as long as they have uh, undergone that mandatory training. So we're about two years into the pilot. What have we learned? We have so far 22 uh, certified paraprofessionals. Through the end of calendar year 2022, uh, they represented paraprofessionals, represented clients in 159 cases um, in Minnesota, and they divide roughly half and half, half landlord tenant, half uh, family law. Um, the program has been most successful in terms of use among legal aid providers and particularly outside the metropolitan area in Minnesota where distances are larger and lawyers are fewer. Um, we have seen some involvement among family law lawyers, um, but not as much as in the legal aid space. Um, our goal has been to make it as easy as possible to become a paraprofessional while maintaining high competency requirements. The more burdensome the process is, the less useful we think this intervention will be. Of course, this is a pilot, so you know we'll see next year how we land. Um, we do think that a key success to the program is to find champions among lawyers who will sponsor and work with paraprofessionals. And continuing that conversation with attorneys, Ron, you alluded to this a little bit, just um, getting their comfort level up and making them, helping them understand that this isn't about taking work away from lawyers. We're not trying to get into their market share. These are cases where lawyers are not doing the work. Um, and so we want to make sure that they understand that that's the view um, that the court is taking on this. Um, in terms of success of the pilot, um, you know, when it ends next spring, we'll be using three broad criteria. First, did it expand access to competent legal help? Is it a useful tool for helping otherwise self-represented litigants navigate the system and ensure that they have a chance to assert their rights? Second, did it improve the efficiency of the courts? And third, is this a model that is economically sustainable, both in the legal aid and in the private market spaces? Um, ultimately, this is about access to justice, and with a goal as fundamental as that, it seems to me that every effort to move the needle forward should be expanded and examined. Thanks so much. And I, I, um, I'm interested in your comment that uh, legal aid programs are taking advantage of this. And from my perspective, and talking to executive directors as I do all the time, the ability of a, a legal aid program that, say, if we're lucky, gets uh, an additional million dollars from some uh, uh, funding source to alternatively hire 10 lawyers or maybe five lawyers and 15 uh, paraprofessionals or maybe 20 paraprofessionals. Those are, that, the, the, that's an empowering uh, tool and a tool that's going to serve the public, I believe. So thank you for that, uh, that insight. Uh, Chief Justice Rush, you bring to us uh, not only your perspective from Indiana, but as uh, uh, president of the uh, uh, Conference of Chief Justices, uh, a national perspective. What, what are you hearing from that perspective uh, from your colleagues, both about the uh, potential of these sorts of alternative provider programs and any potential drawbacks? Sure, thank you, Ron. I want to add to the course, thank you for having us. The Chief Justice is here. We just met. We had a convening of Chief Justices throughout the United States and territories, and this was the topic we just talked about, because so it's that important. Under our constitutions, we're responsible for the admission and discipline of lawyers. We have cases in the unauthorized practice of law. The realities are we don't have enough attorneys to provide the help to the 92% of people that either have less than the, a full attorney or an attorney to help them in a civil legal aid need. 98% of the cases in the country in the state courts, I always tell people from, um, that work in the legislative branch, please come to court. As Chief Justice, I pop in courts all over the state. I popped in eviction court, 250 cases, one morning of eviction. 
Not one of those people were represented by an attorney. And since we're all attorneys here, remember, warranty of habitability, right? I mean, there's all kinds of defenses. As Chief Justice, I wanted to get up and represent all of them. And you think about that. What's more traumatic to a family than being evicted? And we, and in, we happen to have 200, and I'm glad to see some of the cor corporate partners here because the Conference of Chief Justices National Center for State Courts have gotten some large grants from cor um, corporate partners to help us with this funding need to put in, in Indiana, we, brought, we put navigators. They're not legal navigators, they're navigators. So they're dealing with the social needs. How do you get the person linked up to services right from court? Um, we're going to have an attorney shortage. If you don't have one in your community, you will, particularly in rural. It's sort of the graying of the profession. I've been to several talks about this. The numbers are real. We don't have enough attorneys, particularly in rural communities. Um, the Barron County Public Defender Office has 40 openings. Uh, most of us, Megan, I'm not going to put you in there, but the rest of us up here I think are boomers. And we're sort of the group that's graying out. And where are we going to have the lawyers to do it? So we have to look at these. We have to look at this. This is coming. Um, but we want to make sure that we do it in a way that we keep consumer protection. You know, when you look at who's coming to court and what you see, the mental health needs, the substance abuse needs of people, so they not only bring their case to court, they also bring some complex issues. And how do they navigate a complex legal system when they've already got those challenges? I was sitting out in the hallway at a court recently, and I was talking to a woman. I said, are you a party in that case? She goes, oh, honey, that ain't no party in there. Um, <laughs> so the, you know, this is the lingo of what we talk about, so people, so they can navigate and understand what's going on. And it's not just poverty. It's really climbing up that ladder. There's a lot of middle class. Individuals that don't have access are not able, or in small businesses that don't have access. So I think to increase in using this in initiative, uh, law school um, numbers are down. In Indiana, we're 42 out of 50 with regard to number of lawyers, and it's almost like Moneyball, because we can track different communities that we will not even have some attorneys to represent individuals in the future. And we're all talking about it. We talked about this. Um, among the Chief Justices, what are some of the solutions that we have? So I think the promise of looking at regulatory form for the profession is, is going to help. And I'm really encouraged, and I actually compiled something on every state that has it to see if they're getting consumer complaints, and I sent it, and I don't, Ron, Ron if you can post it on the legal service website. I'm not, we're not seeing consumer complaints come up from there, so I think doing it and doing it right um, and unfolding it is going to be key. And I do agree with um, Chief Justice Gilday. I think there's going to be a real role with regard to legal services and legal aid um, entities for partnering with these paralegals because you don't have enough people with regard to the cases. If you're turning away at least half the cases, if you have some of these paraprofessionals, what can they do? And how can we as Chief Justices partner with you um, on getting that done, because it really isn't self-represented. I think it's unrepresented. Um, and I, Nathan, you're c completely correct. You know, what's our currency? It's public trust. And if people don't trust the system because they don't understand it, they don't have access. And a lot of people have an unmet civil legal aid need that they, they don't even know. And that's the need that's keeping them on the streets. That's, a, yeah, that's keeping them from getting their children, getting papers so their grandchildren can get into school, um, and looking at the expungements and different licensing. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. The, you had asked me the promises and perils. The perils really are looking at um, patchwork funding for these programs. We, we have a hard time. I'm going before my legislature right now. I'm asking to double my civil legal aid budget. This is my fourth time asking. I have not gotten it yet. I feel good about this year. So I want you all to be thinking about me. Uh, I should know that in the next couple of weeks because I think that's important. We need to have data. So what we need to be thinking about from the Conference of Chief Justice and National Center for State Courts so we can collect the data so we can make better decisions. If it's working, let's look at your numbers. You said 159. What areas does it work best in? And even if you don't have a formal program, a lot of us are putting navigators in courts um, that are not legal navigators. They're navigators with regard to people struggling with behavioral health issues to, to get help. And I want, I really need to work with the Bar Association and I'm, uh, to make sure that they don't feel that this is a threat to their livelihood because I think the, the need is generally out there, and you're gonna be hearing more and more about lawyer shortages um, around the country, because all the states that I talk to, would you all agree, you're, particularly in your rural communities, you can't feel that we're just gonna put more pressure on it. Thank you, yeah, and uh, we, we do hear a lot about consumer protection, and of course, the question is always compared to what, and uh, 
uh, compared to what in you know 90% or more of the cases, and particularly in rural areas and, and, and elsewhere, the what is uh, no representation. Um, but uh, Chief Justice Gilday, if you could take like two minutes and talk about the uh, protections you have in your program uh, that and the training requirements that uh, serve to um, protect the public. Yeah, this is a serious concern for us, so making sure that paraprofessionals are providing competent and useful advice is the whole point. Um, we require lawyer supervision, as I mentioned, and we believe that the relationship between the lawyer and the paraprofessional on a case-by-case -case basis is key to consumer protection. Our standing committee does um, have the authority to accept consumer complaints and the power to remove paraprofessionals from the register. Um, I feel like I should knock on wood or something, though. We don't have any complaints yet. In fact, the surveys that the Standing Committee has done of judges and attorneys and clients has been largely positive. We haven't set up a separate system for discipline. I mean, this is a pilot, and again, as I said earlier, we're trying to see if what we have in place already can meet some of the unmet needs rather than having to set up a, a new and something new. And we do have the training and education requirements, um, although we've tried to balance the rigor with the practicality. We don't want the training requirements that are unnecessary and that will then deter participation. So you can qualify in Minnesota if you have an associate or bachelor's degree in paralegal studies, um, or if you have a paralegal certificate from an institutionally accredited school and a bachelor's or, or uh, associate's degree in something else, uh, an, uh, a, law, a law degree, um, or uh, um, five years of substantive paralegal experience. And then, as I mentioned, we added the training requirements for paraprofessionals who want to serve clients in orders for protection and harassment restraining orders due to the unique dynamics um, involved in cases in, uh, of domestic or other abuse. And there are ethical requirements. Paraprofessionals have the same obligations as lawyers under the attorney-client privilege and paraprofessionals must take a number of ethics and CLEs. And then there's the issue of insurance. The paraprofessional either, either has to be covered under the lawyer's malpractice insurance um, or they need their own uh, liability. So those are some of the steps we've taken in Minnesota. Uh, Chief Justice Flynn, again, if you could take two minutes. Uh, let's take a slightly different question. You've gone through this relatively recently. What advice would you give uh, to other states that are thinking about these issues uh, um, uh, before their states uh, embark on, on the path that you've, you've been uh, taking the last several years? Well, our approach in Oregon, which seems to, be, seems to have paid off, is a robust process to solicit and evaluate input from wide swath, uh, members of the bar, members of the public, uh, outreach included several surveys, which sought to input from paralegals, from students in paralegal programs, from judges, attorneys, the public at large. Um, the implementation committee also looked at um, feedback from local bar associations, specialty and affinity bars in Oregon. And then the bar also engaged a consultant to reach into communities that are most likely to be served by these licensed paralegals. Um, they connected surveys and focus groups to get a better understanding of what the public wants, what they need, what they're fearful of, and then the consultant prepared a report that we used. It showed 97% of members of the public favored implementation of this program. In our broader study, <laughs> yeah. in our broader surveys, we had 1,000 discrete responses. Um, majority of the responses were actually favorable. Uh, although there are significant concerns, particularly came from lawyers, and then all of the concerns were brought to the attention of the work group for consideration. And uh, the work group actually addressed some of the concerns by making changes to the initial proposals. One of those was um, a concern about consumer protection that um, initially there was no exam requirement at all out of a, you know, an understandable awareness that um, open, you know, that kind of single time exam can be challenging for some people, but that was a concern, and this way we added the exam requirement that focuses on scope of practice. Um, you know, basically, the senior judge who chaired our implementation committee told me that she thinks it was very important that the process involved both those who are supportive as well as those who were skeptical, and we were fortunate in Oregon to have a variety of stakeholders willing to weigh in. 
Thank you. That that 97% uh, figure is is impressive. I'm not sure ice cream could get 97%. <laughs> so that that's pretty good. Uh, Chief Justice Hack, uh, the Texas Access to Justice Commission's work group on access to legal services for low income Texans uh, held its kickoff meeting in January. Could you just take a couple minutes and talk about what approaches might be considered to address the needs of self-represented litigants in Texas? Sure. Um, 97% <laughs> in Oregon, that's a, I think Arizona took a poll, it was only 80%, so there's some hard people in Arizona, but, uh, um, but uh, it, it's uh, our uh, initiative convened a couple of months ago, several months ago, Harriet Myers, who you'll hear from in a minute, um, is uh, helping oversee all of that for our Access to Justice Commission. Uh, we have the, we're in the fantastic position of learning from uh, two people who have been very successful already. Two states have been very successful and others that are working on it. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna uh, uh, follow in that, uh, on that path and try to be as effective as we can in achieving the same things that they are. Thank you. Uh, Chief Justice Rush, last, uh, last thoughts, uh, and, and this is a tough, uh, a tough question because we've been, uh, taken uh, the entirety of our program to talk about uh, so-called regulatory reform, but the courts, like all of us, have gone through COVID and have learned a lot uh, and hopefully have taken, uh, ha have, are taking those lessons to heart and applying them. So. Um, what other operational changes can the courts pursue to make it easier for people, especially those living in poverty, to resolve their problems and, and build trust in our court system? We're building a lot, of, a lot of states are doing online dispute resolution. You think about like Amazon or PayPal doing it, you enjoy your phone, allowing remote hearings when the parties are in agreement and it's not because you don't have to miss work or get points. Um, scheduling text message reminders, we're seeing better show up rates, self-help centers, kiosks, not just in courthouses, but in the dollar stores in the community, places that don't have, you know, that don't close at five o'clock. We're gonna put kiosks in every county in Indiana. Um, having the websites that are workable, the court's triaging cases, so cases that, are, that don't require a lot of judicial resources can get moved quickly, which can help all the cases go through because there is a tremendous backlog still pending past COVID, um, to do annual training for judges on these, on topics like civility, cultural humility, Procedural due process does a lot for access to justice. When, they, when you look at what people care about, they care about coming, being treated fairly. We've got to train our judges. It also has a lot of um, things for looking at diversity, equity, inclusion with regard to how we're training our judges, bringing the whole community in, not just from the county council, county commissioners, mental health providers, and using your superpowers as a judge. Because when, you, when judges invite people to show up at a meeting, they tend to show. So I would say use it for good, not evil. Um, bring your communities together and say, we've got an issue with regard to unmet civil uh, legal aid needs. 80% of people living below poverty um, have at least one unmet civil legal aid. Think of what that can do for, for flipping it. So we're constantly looking, we're constantly open to um, ideas. We've done a lot of convenings on mental health, substance abuse, excessive fees and fines. We've worked with legal services. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but we've got to work with the bar. We've got to work within our larger communities, not just the judiciary with regard to getting these changes. The Justice gap, 92%, we keep talking about it, is obviously daunting. And to make a material dent in it, much less to uh, bridge the gap uh, completely, is gonna take enormous leadership. We are lucky today to have four great judicial leaders, uh, great in their remarks today, but more importantly, in their leadership in their states and across the country. Please join me in thanking them.